Hi everyone, um, and thank you for the introduction. So this talk is about the ECDSA signature and how to compute such a signature in a secure distributed way. And this is a joint work with uh, Yehuda Lindel. So uh, the ECDSA is a signing algorithm which is based on elliptic curves and is widely used in practice, but uh, it gained a lot of interest in recent years because of its use to sign uh, transaction, transactions of uh, cryptocurrency. And I want to start with some uh, motivation. Why do we need uh, such solutions for uh, threshold or distributed signing? So two applications uh, for this. The first application is to protect the signing key. We know that in cryptocurrency, if someone steals uh, my signing key, then it can, it can take uh, money from my account. So we can protect the signing key by splitting it between several um, between several devices so, the, so that even, even if one of the devices is breached, then the signing key is still protected. And this can be used, for example, to um, construct uh, secure cryptocurrency wallets. Uh, a second uh, application is custody. Let's say uh, uh, banks or um, fin other financial institutions may want to uh, protect their uh, customers' accounts by preventing a single party uh, from accessing the signing key and allow only a threshold or a subset of parties to sign. So this, again, this also can be achieved by uh, using a protocol for distributed, distributed signing. So uh, what has been uh, done in this uh, area before, prior to our work? So in the two-party setting, there has been a lot of progress. There are actually very nice uh, solutions. Uh, most of them are based on Palier, uh, with one exception, the work of Donor et al. earlier this year, which based uh, their construction so solely on uh, oblivious transfer. And they, uh, all, they, their uh, signing algorithm is also for two out of n, not only two out of two. Uh, for the multi-party uh, setting, there is one work of Gennaro et al. Um, from two years ago, uh, which showed they presented a protocol for multi-party signing, but without practical multi-party key generation uh, protocol, because their uh, key generation protocol requires um, the use of um, requires distributed uh, uh, Palier key generation, which we don't know how to do uh, from, for more than two parties. And even for two parties, it's really uh, uh, not efficient. So this raises the question, um, is it even possible to construct a full threshold protocol for multi-party ECDSA with both practical distributed key generation and signing? And we answer uh, this question with a positive answer, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And we provide the first protocol for distributed uh, signing and key generation for any number of parties and any access structure. And our protocol is proven secure under simulation by definition and under the assumption that uh, DDH is a hard problem. Um, I should mention that in parallel, so Rosario presented yesterday uh, a similar result, a paper of him and Stephen Goldfelder with a similar result. The main difference between the, the two papers is that uh, is the modeling. Their protocol <laughs> is based, uh, is, is proven secure under uh, game-based definitions. Uh, but to our understanding, the efficiency of the two protocols is pretty much the same. And also, uh, we just heard that a third uh, paper was just accepted to S&P uh, by Donner et al. It's an ex extension of the uh, two-party uh, uh, paper. Uh, so now we have uh, three uh, uh, solutions. Each one has a different approach, which I think is, is always great. Okay, so what is so challenging about distributed ECDSA? We know that th threshold cryptography is something that people have been looking at for many years, and there has been a lot of progress, but somehow ECDSA was kind of left behind. So what is so challenging about um, this algorithm? So to understand this, let's look closer at the signing algorithm. So we have an elliptic curve group with a generator G. M is the message that we want to sign, and X is um, the signing key. And this is uh, the formula how to compute uh, a signature S. So let's look closer at this formula. So here we have um, a H of N is just a hash of the message, which obviously also in the distributed setting would be something that ca we can uh, locally compute because the message is known by all the parties. Uh, X is the signing key that in the distributed setting should be uh, somehow shared somehow shared among the parties. K is a fresh random element that is chosen um, 
each time you want to sign, it's, 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 a, it's a new random element for each signature, signature. And R is also computed using K. We take K, multiply it with the generator G, and obtain a point on the elliptic curve. And then we take its X coordinate. Uh, this is um, denoted as, a small, as, as small R. Um, so as you can see from, uh, from this expression, obviously in, it's very clear that in the distributed setting, also K, the value of K should also be kept secret, right? Because otherwise, if we know K, if the parties know K, and then they see the signature, they will, ever, will be able to compute X from the signature. They will be able to compute the signing key. So K must also be kept secret, and therefore the challenge of computing ECD, say, in a distributed manner, is to compute both the inverse of K and K times G for some random K that is kept secret during the execution. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the main challenge. And in the work of Gennaro et al, um, in the work of Gennaro et al, um, which is the starting point of our protocol, they presented the following way uh, to compute, to, to do this task. Okay, so they start with, with having each party choosing two random share, k, i, and y, and they use additive sharing. So the secret is just the sum of the shares of the parties. Uh, and then uh, the protocol proceeds by having each party sending k i times g to the other parties and also sending an encryption of row i to all the other parties. Then it's very easy to compute k times g because we only all, we sum all the k i times j that we have. Uh, so we have now k times g. And if the encryption scheme is additively, morph is additively morphic, then we can sum also the encryption of, of all the row i's and obtain an encryption of row. Then the parties, uh, each party uh, multiplies the encryption of row with its share of k, and again send it to all the other parties, with a zero knowledge proof to prove that it used the same ki that was used uh, in the previous step. And then once the party has an all the encryption of ki times row, uh, they can sum the, 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 these encryptions and obtain an encryption of k times row. Then they decrypt this uh, encryption. They, now they see k times row in the clear, and they can uh, compute the inverse of this value. So eventually they, uh, they, um, they hold the inverse of k times something that is random, and therefore k is kept secret. And we will see in a few minutes how we can use this to compute the signature. But from looking this, uh, at this process, uh, you can easily see that a crucial part of this, uh, of this process is the fact that the encryption scheme is additively homomorphic. So what in the additively homomorphic encryption we know, so uh, the simple solution is uh, Palier, which is the encryption scheme that was used uh, by, in that work. Uh, but the problem is that in order to use Palier, we need distributed key generation for, um, with, for uh, the Palier key, which we don't know how to do uh, for more than two parties, and even for two parties, it's uh, expensive. A uh, second problem, which is uh, not as severe, but it's also uh, a problem, um, we eventually, we end up with working over two groups. We have the uh, uh, elliptic curve group, ellipt elliptic uh, curve group, and also the uh, much larger group when uh, for uh, the Pali for Palier. So eventually, this causes different sort of problems, and the zero knowledge proof that we end with are very complicated. So, um, in order to solve this problem, and this is the main contribution of uh, our work, we replace Palier with additively homomorphic El Gamal. What is additively homomorphic El Gamal? It's the same as the standard El Gamal that we all know, but instead of encrypting A, the, uh, the message, we encrypt G to the message. Uh, in, this, in the example here, we encrypt G to the A. And by doing this, we obtain an encryption scheme that is additively homomorphic. It's very easy to see that. Uh, and the advantage of using this kind of encryption scheme is that we work with the same group as, as uh, the group that uh, uh, we work uh, in the signature. And also all the zero knowledge proofs are highly efficient. Um, decryption is also um, very easy. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very easy to do sec um, secure distributed decryption. But the problem is, and this is something that we need to address, that this is not really decryption, right? Because eventually we end up, we end up with G to the A, 
and not with the actual encrypted message, right? So in that sense, this encryption scheme is not really an encryption scheme. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, if we have G to the A, to compute A means to solve the discrete loop problem, which is uh, considered, assumed to be hard. So in order to overcome this um, obstacle, we do the following. Uh, um, so what we do is we keep an additive sharing of all the encrypted messages that we have during the execution of the protocol. And by doing this, we can now, uh, we can now uh, decrypt the messages. So once, let's say we want to decrypt uh, um, some uh, encryption, so now we can run the decryption uh, protocol, then we obtain G to the A, and then each party sends its share of A to all the other parties. And then the parties can take G to the sum of these shares and check that it's equal to the, um, to the value that they received from the decryption uh, algorithm. And if uh, the equality holds, then they know that they hold the correct encrypted message. If not, then the party just abort. So this is uh, the main idea behind uh, our protocol. And uh, now when, that we understood this, let's see uh, an overview of how exactly the protocol looks like. So assume we have three parties, and each party holds a sharing of the secret key X from the uh, key generation step. At the beginning of the sending algorithm, each party chooses uh, a sharing, a share, a random share for K. And then the, the protocol proceeds by having each party send an encryption of each share of K to all the other parties. Once the parties have uh, all the, uh, encryption of, the encryption of all the shares of K, the party can compute the value of R by summing all these encryptions of all the shares. Then we end up with an encryption of K, and then we can just run a secure decryption um, for this ciphertext. And remember that decryption of uh, our encryption scheme uh, gives us K times G, which in this case is exactly what we want, so this is great. So once we have k times g, we can take the x coordinate, which we uh, called, which we use small r to denote it, and then uh, so this is now this we know that we know now this value. Then the protocol proceeds by uh, having each party locally compute a sharing of r times x plus the hash of the message, and now now r and the hash of the message are, are now public, so these are only linear operations over additive shares, and the parties can do that, this locally by multiplying, each party can multiply its share with the value of R and add the hash of the message. Okay, so um, now the, uh, the next step is to each party choose a random sharing of some random row, as we've seen before, and then the parties, so now each party has another uh, uh, random share, and then uh, the parties run an MPC protocol twice. Once to compute row, which is shared between the parties, and uh, R times X plus the hash of the message, the message, which is also shared between the parties. And a second protocol to multiply K, which is also, sh which is also shared between the parties, and row. <coughs> so we have here two protocols to multiply two values that are shared among the parties, and the output of the protocol is revealed to the parties. So once the parties have uh, these two values, they can take the inverse of the second one and multiply it with the first one. So now row and row and the inverse of row cancel each other, and then we end up with the correct signature. Okay, so the only thing that is left is to understand how this MPC protocol uh, works. And remember that we need it twice to multiply two values that are shared uh, between the parties. So now, that, so let's see how this um, secure multiplication protocol works. So in this uh, protocol, each party holds, uh, we, let's say the inputs are A and B, each party holds a share of, this, uh, of these values. So at the beginning of the protocol, each party sends an encryption of its shares to all the other parties. Then since we use uh, an additive homomorphic encryption, the parties can sum these encryptions and obtain an encryption of the two inputs of A and B. Now the parties uh, proceed with two sub-protocols that, that they run in parallel. And, and the first protocol on the right is to, compute, is to compute the encryption of the multiplication of A times B. Uh, this is done in the following way. So each party multiply 
uh, the encryption of one of the inputs with each share of the second uh, input. Let's say they, uh, they multiply the, sh the share of B with the encryption of A, and they send it to all the other parties with a proof of knowledge that they used the same BI that all the other parties hold an encryption of. And then once uh, the parties have an, uh, the encryption of BI times A of all, from all the other parties, they can again sum it and obtain an encryption, a correct encryption of A times B. The correctness is guaranteed by the zero knowledge uh, proof that they used. Now, now the problem is that we can't, I mean, we, if we de uh, decryption of this uh, uh, cyclodex will end up only with AB times the generator. And therefore we run in parallel another protocol uh, to multiply uh, the additive shares. Okay, and the main observation here is that we don't need a fully secure protocol here. We only need a protocol that uh, guarantees uh, privacy. Only, we only need a protocol that uh, prevents uh, any leak of information. But uh, we don't care if the, if the result of the protocol is correct. So at the end of this protocol, the, the parties hold an additive sharing of some value C, which if the parties behaved correctly, it's, um, it's the correct output. Otherwise, we can use the encryption that we have on the right side to um, validate uh, the correctness of uh, this sharing. So we decrypt to obtain AB times G, and then we can run this uh, simple check. And if this equality holds, then we know that uh, the additive sharing that we have, the, the parties open it, and they hold the correct output. Otherwise, the party just abort. Um, now, the, this is already pretty complicated, but there are actually even more details to this protocol. For example, um, we need to make sure that nothing is leaked from the last check, from the fact that the party is accepted or aborted, and therefore there are some additional steps in this protocol, but this is the main idea. Eventually, this protocol is a general MPC protocol to multiply two values that are shared together. It works very similarly to many uh, general, uh, many known MPC protocols. The main difference is that instead of using um, in, uh, MAC over the additive shells as used in state of the art protocols, we use here the Elgamal encryption as a commitment um, for uh, the inputs. Okay, so remember that we use this protocol twice in the protocol, and this is eventually the main um, uh, the, the main part of the entire protocol. So I will. Uh, so two final uh, remarks. Um, so I, I said we use private multiplication. So how can we instantiate this uh, protocol? So there is, these are two uh, very common ways in MPC. Uh, first way is to use oblivious transfer. Uh, this is good if we don't care about the bandwidth and we want to have um, very low computational work. Uh, second way is to use additively homomorphic encryption. I stress that this is not the same uh, additively homomorphic encryption. It shouldn't, doesn't have to be the same as we used in the signing algorithm. Here we don't have in this, um, without going into the details, we don't need here any uh, distributed uh, key generation or the distributed encryption. We just use an encryption to, um, to uh, um, in, inside this um, private multiplication protocol. Uh, so therefore, we can use here Polyer, and we we use in our um, in our implementation. Uh, the main uh, advantage here in, when using additive homomorphic encryption is that the bandwidth is very low. On the other hand, uh, the computational work is much higher than when using oblivious transfer. Another remark is that well, the protocol as I described it is um, is for the case where we have n but uh, all but one corruption. But the protocol can be easily translated to support other access structures, like for example, t out of n, or any other weird combination of subset of user that can be represented by a logic circuit. And I will end uh, with showing you some uh, experimental results. So we implemented our protocol and ran some experiments. Uh, you can see the technical details here for different number of parties from two out uh, up to 20 parties. We used palier based uh, private multiplication because we think that for uh, application that we want to use this protocol, low bandwidth is more important. Uh, and these are the results. You can see here um, the running time in milliseconds for different number of parties. The top line is the key generation, the bottom line is signing. So I didn't say anything about the key generation, but it includes 
all the establish establishing the ECDSA key, all the keys that we need for the added degree homomorphic encryption, and so on. And it takes it takes time, but eventually remember that the key generation is ran only once, or at least once in a while. So this is reasonable. Uh, for the signature, we need uh, 300 milliseconds for two parties, five seconds for 20 parties. Uh, we stress that the code that we use is not yet optimized, and we think that, and we, we intend to optimize it, and we think that uh, these running times can be significantly, significantly improved. But even though, uh, still, it, with, still the results uh, prove that this protocol is practical and can be used uh, to solve real-world uh, problems. Uh, this concludes my talks. The full uh, paper is on ePrint. Thank you very much.